I wanted to say first and foremost that this presentation could probably be given by many other colleagues I know who have worked and dedicated their lives to knowledge diversity, decolonization, equality, better research cultures. So obviously, inevit inevitably, this presentation is informed by my own understanding of decolonization and experiences. Uh, and, and as I will talk, decolonization can be very subjectively understood. So uh, again, I do apologize if I don't cover everything that our audience might, might anticipate being covered uh, under this topic. Uh, it, it could be a presentation that, that could take uh, you know, uh, hours to, to do. Um, so I wanted to start by positioning myself again, because decolonization is a word that is being used more and more often as a buzzword and is being streamlined and oftentimes it's being appropriated by the system uh, to, to maintain itself, uh, which is a decolonial critique in itself. I'd like to just uh, stress that this is very personal to me. It's been very personal to me for 12 years now that I work in this area. For those who know me, uh, for those who don't know me, I just wanted to just position myself and tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I really come to this as someone who was born outside of the Western epistemological framework. Framework. I was born in Moldova, a low and middle in, a, a low uh, income country, apologies, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and very early in my life, uh, my family and I migrated to Southern Europe for, for a better uh, for a better life due to, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and in that experience, I encountered the Western gaze uh, of my own society and certain generalizations and universalisms, but also the marginalization of, of my own knowledge system. Uh, and then I started looking at African agricultural development due to my life contingencies uh, and gender system in particular in African uh, communities. And those uh, that literature also maintained, uh, sort of promoted and perpetuated certain generalizations and universalisms. Um, so I, you know, I took it upon myself to actually discover new ways of engaging with communities uh, through their own languages and co conceptual repertoires, uh, implementing a decolonial anthropological approach in my own disciplines and decolonizing my own disciplines, which is uh, I'm really working at the intersection of international development, gender studies and religious studies. Uh, but in parallel, I have been very active in my own PhD career uh, in the UK. Uh, previously, I started in the US. Uh, again, similar issues emerged there. Uh, was to try and decolonize again our research culture, uh, starting as a PhD and then now in my in my current position as a UK uh, research fellow. Um, so one of the things that I started was decolonial subversions. If you are familiar with it, uh, if not, it's a multilingual, multimodal publication platform where we really try to uh, give validity to every voice in the world. So anyone can publish their knowledge and their research uh, and, and can skew the biases and the, and the normative standards of the Western epistemological framework. Um, I've also been involved with the Decolonizing Research Initiative at SOAS, University of London. And this is an initiative that actually has sought to bring together uh, researchers, research managers, and funders to apply decolonial lens to research structures and practices in higher education and really look at how our research development processes, including our standards of research, research uh, uh, development and, and partnerships building with other institutions in Africa and Asia can promote or not equitable partnerships. So I'm going to speak, my presentation really is informed by, again, my, my own passion, but my, my experiences as well. Um, and, and again, uh, I do apologize if I don't cover what you anticipated being covered. I, I want to start with a very basic understanding of research integrity. Again, I think we're talking about research integrity, so it's, it's important to have an understanding of what, what do we mean by that, at least in the UK and European framework and international framework, because again, this understanding is informed by international conventions. Um, so I wanted, recently I met the chair of the Quarry Committee, the Committee on Research Integrity in the UK, and they passed me the Research Integrity in the UK Annual Statement. And in there, I found this excerpt, which I think encompasses very well what, what this concept is about. Um, so I'm gonna quote, while sometimes assumed to relate largely to cases of misconduct, misconduct, research integrity encompasses the behaviors, actions, norms, and culture that support good research practice, as well as the trustworthiness of the research record. Integrity also lies at the heart of repro reproducibility and replicability of research. Rigor in research methodology, as well as honesty and transparency in how the research is carried out, is what allows people to either reproduce research or to understand how the researchers came to their findings. So again, it's not just about uh, misconduct and, and, and uh, you know, being honest and transparent, but it really is about the ethos that um, underpins the research process. 
I also wanted to look very briefly at what we mean by decolonization and decoloniality. Again, not only because these are terms that were concepts that have existed and, and have sort of been redefined and, and reinvigorated over time, but also because it is very subjective, subjectivity grounded. There are concepts that are understood through, through our own uh, position in the world, right? How we relate to histories of colonialism, so where we are based geographically, our countries uh, and personal histories, our wealth group, our sociocultural locus which is really what we call uh, the feminist uh, literature has has oftentimes used the term positionality. Um, and I think Jacqueline, uh, the, the next presenter, will, will maybe refer to this more than, than I do in my presentation. So the first thing I want to say is obviously decolonization can refer to territorial and political decolonization movements as occurred in former colonies. Uh, oftentimes uh, we, we we like to mention the example of the Haitian Revolution, uh, give credit you know, to other independence movements post-World War II, uh, but it could also refer to epistemological, cultural, and cognitive emancipation or liberation of the mind, a certain uh, very, uh, very influential voices have have uh, have sort of termed it and coined it. And I'm going to to um, to refer to these um, these these thinkers uh, later on in my presentation. Um, and decoloniality specifically is a school of thought and movement that emerged in Latin America as a critique of ongoing colonialism after the end of uh, territorial and political decolonization. So the, so the argument is that colonialism continues or coloniality continues actually uh, through the dominance of, uh, you know, through imperialism, through the dominance of, of Western knowledge and globalization. So oftentimes decolonial thinkers speak about the coloniality modernity matrix, right, that extends beyond colonialism. Uh, and it's international because it's not limited to, to those who were colonized, but it really extends internationally through the paradigm of modernity and its paraphernalia. And I also wanted to stand very briefly on the concept of epistemology. Again, these are this is jargon that we oftentimes use in academia in our disciplines, but it is important that we understand what epistemology refers to and what these epistemological inequalities, um, how they are they could be understood. I like to uh, to cite uh, Black educator Gloria Latson Billings who has previously noted that epistemology is ultimately linked to worldview. Uh, epistemology is really the system through which we make knowledge and the criteria of knowledge validity that we take as normative and as standard. In my own decolonial anthropological engagements with communities, I have come to understand also that individuals, myself included, are always epistemologically situated, which means that our personal worldviews and our cultural socialization inevitably influence our conceptual, theoretical, and analytical frameworks, how we see the world, that is to say. So historically, the Western European colonialists were very influential, uh, but also other colonial and imperial forces around the world, including, for instance, in Central Asia, the Soviet Union, uh, and in other parts of the world as well. So each, each part of the world may have their own regional colonialisms that it experienced, and um, projected their worldviews, interests, and understandings of humanity onto the other. Of course, Western European colonialists were much more influential due to the paradigm, uh, you know, due to the knowledge systems and, and the fact that colonialism continued through the mind and the culture, uh, as Kenyan uh, writer Nigugi Wationgo has put it in Decolonizing the Mind. I do recommend that work if you'd like to start reading something, uh, but also through the paraphernalia of modernity. So the Western uh, paradigm, uh, sorry, the, the modernity paradigm, as Anibal Chiano, Mignola, and many others have, have argued in the Latin American context. Um, so many of these assumptions have continued through power asymmetries that we see in research practices. Uh, again, I have cited uh, Linda Tuhui Smith, her work on decolonizing methodologies uh, is, is very important. Again, if you'd like to start somewhere. And, and, and the, in parallel to this, there is still a an, an, an idea or, or a, an assumption that knowledge uh, in high income societies or in high income countries uh, is, is more advanced. So there's this idea that there is a surplus uh, in high income countries and there is a deficit of knowledge in low and middle income countries. And so knowledge transfer continues to be mostly one way, as uh, I've argued with my colleague Mariam Romina in a previous paper. So this results in an unequal world system. And as I see it, I've, I've, I've shown this scheme, the schematic multiple times before, I, I see this epistemological dominance of, of, of the West, uh, again, which is very culturally specific and embedded in the history of these societies. Uh, and so that means that the standards of knowledge and the, the idea and the concepts and, and, and um, 
and and the um you know the, the knowledge that is considered valid is very much informed by the cultural standards of those societies so that epistemological dominance is underpinned also by the ideological normative cultural and political prevalence of these societies and additionally is underpinned by material inequalities and structural inequalities for example funding bodies are primarily based in high income countries as opposed to low income countries and funding bond bodies tend to dictate their own standards of excellence again those standards are influenced by their own cultural context Context and regulatory frameworks. So what does a decolonial approach to re research integrity mean? How could we conceptualize this? Uh, I've come up with a very um, uh, rough definition, I guess, in thinking about it. It's not very comprehensive, but I understand this as an approach that looks at the system as a whole, this unequal system that I discussed, and understands how epistemological and power asymmetries related to colonialism, Western and regional colonialisms, and the dominance of Western modernity coloniality in the world have influenced and continue to influence research practices and standards, including our definitions and criteria of research integrity and ethics. Um, so really having that reflexivity. And what does that mean when we think about research practices and norms? So uh, in 2019, we set up the Decolonizing Research Initiative at SOAS, where we started to discuss, we brought together researchers, research managers, uh, partners from Asia and Africa to kind of apply a decolonial lens to, to, to research practice. And, and we looked at three levels uh, of, of analysis. First, at the research methodologies, the uh, research practices and ethics of the researchers, from research design uh, to, the, to the level of, uh, to the stage of implementation. We also also looked at research funding priorities, eligibility criteria, and due diligence structures, expectations that funders have, right, that, that govern funding and research partnerships. And then we looked at research development practices within universities and research institutes, but especially how their processes were conducive or not to partnerships building um, and, and, and equitable collaborations with other research offices and research departments in, Af in, in, um, in non-Western societies, for our, in, for in our case, Africa and Asia, where we primarily work. So in, in having these conversations with our colleagues from across the world, these are not only my ideas, this is cumulative knowledge that has been, you know, um, you know, understandings that we have arrived at through many conversations. Uh, some of the critiques that are raised when we, when we apply decolonial lens to research include the fact that research practice, ethics, impact, concepts, again, that govern funder language and university frameworks are oftentimes defined within a Western European North American regulatory framework. Again, the standards of knowledge validation that are favored in the Western world, for example, positivist methods, quantitative matrix, large data sets tend to be promoted or favored, while lived experience, embodied or non-discursive knowledge, I work, for example, a lot with religious knowledge, are oftentimes marginalized or ignored. Uh, additionally, modes and forms of knowledge production defined within a modernity paradigm uh, tends to favor certain culture-specific standards that tend to uh, promote bias. So this is the citation politics where we need to cite certain authoritative voices that in the past have been primarily Western European and North American, uh, peer review norms and biases, but also the prevalence of single author publications and the idea of law and, and the fact that at least historically knowledge has been locked, right? It has been considered owned and, and um, uh, you know, primarily accessible to specialized communities. Additionally, uh, critiques that are raised include the fact that within the university and the research context, oftentimes the reward system and culture that dominate sometimes and often have perpetuated ethnocentrism, inequitable partnerships, but also the instrumentalization of research participants and communities, which is a very important pro problem and critique that indigenous researchers have raised. Um, additionally, quality of research outputs have been te have tended to be dictated by, again, the standards of a Western culture. So historically, again, high impact journal publications were valued more than non-English outputs for instance, or outputs that are uh, addressed to communities for impact and have valued, again, outputs that are not, were not historically determined by how, how much uh, benefit they are to the real communities. So again, this is changing now with open access movements and, and uh, revisiting the concept of impact, but these are problems that still continue. So what does decolonizing research cultures uh, mean and how can that promote uh, research integrity? I think I've thought about two steps um, to, to move in that direction. Step one would be what I call recognizing and diversifying. So that means to recognize that Anglo-American European standards are not universal, they are not normative around the world, and they have been inevitably culturally influenced and specific by the sociocultural and historical context of these societies, which is not shared across all societies of the world. Secondly, understand how research practice and research standards are defined and conceptualized in other contexts of the world to make research integrity language more accessible and more diverse. 
the second, oh, uh, and apologies, before I move to the second step, I did want to bring up an example uh, because it can be quite abstract. And, and this is informed by our engagement with non-Western authors at decolonial subversions primarily. And it's around the concept of known, knowledge ownership and plagiarism. As we know, plagiarism is an important issue that comes up within conversations of research integrity. I think and I understand the concept of plagiarism to be premised on this on, on an understanding or a, an assumption that knowledge can be owned and attributed. Now, in many contexts of the world, knowledge is oftentimes seen as collective and open, so not something that can be owned or locked. And I think that this point, and, and we've seen the decolonial subversions as well, that there is a need to understand diverse approaches to engaging ancestral knowledge, so how different communities engage with uh, inherited knowledge and knowledge that they create, and to ensure, again, that Anglo-American and European definitions are not assumed as universal or self-explanatory, but are properly presented and justified to non-Western collaborators. Again, there is this attitude oftentimes that when non-Western researchers come to the UK, they should know our rules of game, but that's not that, that should not be the case. Our rules of game are our rules of game, not theirs necessarily. Uh, and step two would be to make visible positionality related power and biases. So not only reflect and recognize the biases of the past, but then consider carefully how our positionality, as I said, the cumulative effect of who we are, our affiliations, our socialization, our uh, geographical location, how everything we are informs our research and the epistemological assumptions that we take for granted and we assume uh, as relevant to a research context and community. And, and think and make transparent in our research how our positionality uh, defined our engagements with our research participants and our research assistants and our research collaborators and partners and give due credit where you know give credit where this is due uh, especially to individuals of lesser power and this uh, moves us to a direction in the direction of decolonial ethics. Now, I don't know if this is a term being used currently, I actually did not have time to do some research on it. I call it decolonial ethics, but really I understand this as um, an understanding of ethics that moves beyond the ethical standards that are being enforced by UK higher education institutions, funders and regulatory bodies currently. Uh, and as an ethics uh, standard that centers on research researcher positionality and embodying an ethos of humility, reflexivity, and self-awareness uh, with respect and care for research community. So really moving to uh, an embodied ethics, right? That is retreative, that is subjective, and that is uh, constantly reflected upon. And, 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 and practicing that, that ethos then raises a number of ethical questions that we can reflect on throughout our research, uh, such as, do we implement epistemological and methodological humility and reflexivity in our cross-cultural work? Are we open to generally learning from our research participants and collaborators, or do we assume to be the experts? Are we prepared to reflect and recognize the epistemological, theoretical, disciplinary, and personal biases that we carry with us and to challenge them actively throughout our research? Uh, do we consider, acknowledge, and integrate the contributions of collaborators? Again, as I said, especially those of lesser power who are not represented and have a voice within our system. Do we seriously consider the impact that our research may have on the research participants and their communities? And are we prepared to step back when negative impact is anticipated? And lastly, are we prepared to acknowledge negative or null results? So, so results of research that we do not anticipate and we do not like necessarily, and can we admit honest mistakes? So there are individual and there are institutional responsibilities and uh, initiatives that we can take. As individuals, we can try to cultivate heightened reflexivity of our epistemological legacies and engage closely with the worldviews and languages of the communities we conduct research with to subvert the dominance of a single lens in the world. And we have to try to become more inclusive, transparent and humbler with our uh, you know, collaborators and, and promote joint research outputs, uh, because I think that joint research outputs can can improve research rigor, but also genuine mutual knowledge exchange across societies. Uh, in terms of institutional and regulatory initiatives, I believe the regulatory bodies and funders could revisit and open their definitions, criteria and language of research integrity to encompass decolonial ethics as I define them. Um, universities could reward and encourage research where decolonial ethics are visibly embodied, so really reward the people who do the hard work and the dirty work, right, um, and move away, cease to tolerate extractivist research cultures. Uh, and lastly, HI, the higher education and environment apologies should normalize zero or limited success in research. So we should normalize 
uh, finding null results, ad, you know, admitting, making making it easy for a researcher to admit that you know the research is not generalizable, uh, generalizable due to methodological decisions, or that they didn't, you know, they were not able to think about issues that should have been thought of about early on, uh, but also to normalize decisions to avoid research. So sometimes it's better to not do research in a context because of the anticipated negative impact than to do research. So we need to normalize saying no uh, and, and, and finding results that are not what we anticipated. Um, so I like to point out, uh, to end by pointing out that it is everyone's responsibility to try and, and promote a better culture that I think, uh, you know, in decolonial ethics, that I think can also make research integrity stronger in the UK and the world. Um, I have included some references for anyone who'd like to go back to the works that I uh, mentioned, and also some additional resources, uh, primarily uh, based on the outputs of our decolonizing research initiative and work at Decolonial Subversions. Thank you so much. Rowena, thank you very much. That was an enthralling presentation and a fantastic and deep grounding in the topic. So thank you so much. Okay, we've had quite a few questions in the Q&A, but about five minutes to cover them, so I'll just go in and uh, pick some out. Okay, we have a question from Simon, who asks, how can decolonize... Now, this was made right as your presentation started, so you may feel it was answered in the later slide. How can decolonization avoid, he says, quote-unquote, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, i.e. rather than rejecting all... Western knowledge, how can it both recognize the good bits and then critically build on them rather than simply replace them? Shall I respond or take a couple of questions and uh, respond quickly? To respond to that one, yeah. Yes, um, I mean, thank you, Simon. This is an excellent question. It always comes up and I'm of the point, I'm a pragmatist, right? Um, uh, I'm an ideal, idealist in my vision, but a pragmatist in the implementation process. And I think um, we, we certainly need to understand that every context of the world has contributed valuable knowledge. Uh, so we're not throwing the bath, you know, the baby with the bathwater. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to uh, a lot of the a disciplinary, you know, it's sort of the inherited knowledge we have within the disciplines that I work with. Uh, but, but I think we do need to apply a, a more critical lens as to where that knowledge came from, who were the people who created that knowledge, uh, what was their stance in society, you know, what was the, you know, what was their political ideology, because again, no knowledge is neutral uh, or acultural. And I think it's it's not about discarding knowledge, but it's about revisiting the knowledge that we have inherited with a more critical eye. And that allows you then to, to assess what is useful useful and what is not useful, especially in our contemporary society and changing environment. Does that does that make sense, Simon? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Damien asks if you could elaborate on non-discursive discurs knowledge and what kind of advantages it might have for breaking the positivist paradigm. Yes, well, I work in uh, gender, religious and development. Uh, so at, at the intersection of gender, religions and development studies, and uh, a lot of the knowledge that my research participants communicate is non-discursive in the sense of uh, it not necessarily being articulated. Uh, it's it's uh, spiritual. It's their spirituality. Right. It's uh, it's uh, their way of living and there's their worldviews that are not necessarily articulated, uh, but they're being embodied and practiced in everyday uh, practices and norms. And so uh, as an anthropologist, these are a very the, the non discursive side of, of life is as important as the discursive, uh, because the individual is not just. Uh, you know, what we see, but it's actually a, you know, multidimensional entity. And so it's very important that we pay attention to, to that knowledge. So there's multiple formats uh, and ways of expressing one's uh, lived existence, right? That's what I'm referring to. We need to try and capture all these different ways of, of people's expressed livelihood and, and uh, sorry, a lived experience, um, because, because we, we might miss something very important in what you know, shapes their worldview and shapes their uh, their behavior in the everyday life that we see. So there's much more be behind behind what we see. There's there's what is, which is much more substantive than what is what seems. Does that make sense? So that sorry, that was very philosophical. <laughs> no, it's very helpful. Thank you very much. I think uh, we've got time for I think one or two more questions. We had two about research ethics processes, which are mm -hmm. lumped together. The first was from Jenny, who said uh, she was puzzled that you. Uh, considered that current ethical process don't value the aspects that you've identified. So perhaps your thoughts on that. And the second was Zora asked, what can uh, ethics committees do to help decolonize research projects that are already in kind of the final planning stages, have funding, etc.? 
Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I missed the name of the person who has the first question. Uh, uh, Jenny. Jenny, no, I think it was a misunderstanding. I wasn't saying that, maybe I wasn't very articulate, apologies. It was not saying that the ethics standards we have are not useful or helpful. And I do think that there's a lot of effort being made within universities today, uh, you know, with research ethics panels to, to really look in depth at the ethical concerns that research projects raise in specific contexts. I've been in such review committees and I know that you know academics and very experienced people are doing that groundwork but what I'm talking about here is about individual decolonial ethics so decolonial ethics being embodied by each researcher individual in the field and it's a it's it's sort of a step forward and a step further than what we already do so it's it's a reiterative approach to ethics that a research committee cannot do a research committee will revisit ethical issues before the research or during the research where some ethical issues emerge uh, but but it's on the researcher to embody that ethical reflexivity that they need to embody throughout the research process and in interaction with their participants so really I'm talking about sort of the next step forward and a more retrative embodied approach to ethics, which is aided by the ethical standards that we have in the university. But I do think that the universities can do more to, to, to promote and encourage that decolonial reflexivity and decolonial ethics that I'm talking about that, that researchers as individuals should embody in the field. Does that, does that clarify, Jenny? Thank you. That's very helpful, Maria. Thank you so much. Uh, 